So uh, this talk is called How to Save the Environment or Why Nobody Takes Your Security Advice. Um, so let me give you a little bit of background on, um, on why I'm giving this talk. Um, I have had this, this idea in my head for a couple of years um, after living with a, uh, a few people right straight out of college who were very environmentally friendly. And um, there was one particular point, and I'll actually um, share that with you when we come to it, uh, where I realized that maybe I'm not giving advice uh, as far as security advice, and maybe I'm not giving advice as, uh, as well as I, sh I could be or should be. Um, and this is because I received a piece of perfectly technically uh, uh, workable advice, but that was fundamentally flawed. And so this talk uh, aims to give you a whole lot of perfectly technically uh, um, workable, environmentally friendly uh, advice that is fundamentally flawed in some way, and then to relate that back to common security advice that you have almost certainly all heard, or even given at some point. Um, and it, it's sort of a PSA uh, about how uh, the technical is not the only consideration. Whether or not something technically works is not the only consideration for um, you know, good security advice. You know, and that's exemplified with uh, never go on the internet, right? Like, yeah, of course that's terrible advice. And that's a very obvious to see, but there are more subtle things which we'll get into. So, like I said, um, this is sort of a PSA, but the, what, what I'm trying to do here is a kind of an experiment in forced empathy. So, how many people here care, care about security? I, I love that some people didn't raise their hands. I just, uh, that's the only reason I asked that question. Um, so everybody here cares about security. If you didn't care about security, you wouldn't be here. Um, either that or your, bo your boss sent you here and you're really pissed off to be here and you're hoping this, this talk would be funny. Well, I won't disappoint you, or I'll, I'll try not to disappoint you. Um, so the idea behind this is that, uh, how many people here are environmental experts? Oh, great. Excellent. Um, so um, I'm not an environmental expert, uh, but you know, um, but this is all advice that either I've been given or it's just you know straightforward. Uh, but the idea is that uh, very few of you here come face to face with um, the environment and what humans are doing to it on a daily basis. Uh, but you're face to face with security and security problems every single day. I mean, how many people? here have had to deal with the heartbleed stuff that's been going on. Yeah, so it's hard, to, it's hard to have to deal with something like that and things like that on a pretty regular basis and not become dated uh, and not uh, place a big emphasis on security because we know that things like that happen. But we don't know that, you know, like, you know, the latest BP oil spill, we heard about that, but we don't know just how bad it is. Um, so yeah, and we don't know how long it's going to take for before all the ice caps melt and new ice age or whatever if we keep going in our current. But we know, we've heard that, yeah, okay, if we keep doing what we're doing, we're going to run out of this or we're going to die because of that. And we, we, we kind of understand that in the back of our heads, but it's not on the forefront. And so I'm gonna try to use that as a way to get you guys to experience what, what people experience when you tell them some piece of impractical advice that technically works. Um, when, you, when, when the users just don't care for whatever reason. And it's not even so much about caring, but anyway, like I said, I'm not an environmental expert. I'm a security expert, or I, at least that's where my background is. Um, so let's, let's, start, let's start talking about how to recycle. So recycling is real easy. It's just a three-step process. Um, you know, recycling is, is, is very important. Uh, it reduces the amount of resources that we need to produce things like bottles, you know, useful tools for us to use. Um, and rather than mining new materials and creating new materials from, from you know, scratch, uh, we can renew old materials. And you're still using energy, and so it's better to reuse or to not use things, but recycling is very good if you must use plastics or glass or whatever else. So, um, so what you do is you look for the recycling symbol and you toss it in your recycling bin and nice people take it away for you, from you and, and recycle it for you and you don't have to recycle it yourself and it's great. So uh, 
Okay, so there's, okay, wait, hold on a second. So there's a number in the middle, um, and so some of them actually aren't recyclable. So some things have a recycle symbol on them, but they're not actually recyclable. So, okay, it's a little bit more complex. So, all right, um, one, four, and five are generally recyclable by most recycling programs. There are some that will take this or that and not the others, and, but seven, like, you can't, you just can't recycle seven. It's just an indication of, like, this is the type of plastic. Um, so check if it's number one, number four, or number five, and if it's one of those, then it's almost certainly going to be recyclable. Most recycling programs will take one, four, or five. Um, no, no, some, some won't. Um, some will take ones other than one, four, or five. So, okay. Um, all right, well, hold on a sec. Okay. So, here's what you do. You carry a bag around you, with you, for recyclables. And anytime you find anything that might be recyclable, stick it in the bag. When you get home with your bag of potential recyclables, check all the numbers, and then call your local uh, recycling program and ask which numbers they will accept for recycling. All right. So... The problem with all this is that this only applies to plastics. So if you have to, uh, once you're finished consuming this jar of tears that you have cried uh, after having learned to recycle plastics, you still don't know how to recycle glass. So how to recycle? Throw everything in the recycling bin and let somebody else deal with it. Anything that might be recyclable, just let somebody else deal with it. So I'd like to relate this to crypto. So. Um, if you, ever, if you have ever tried to write crypto code, um, you might have gotten a little crazy. It's ridiculous, all the things that you need to know in order to write proper crypto code. Even proper cryptographers get crypto code wrong. Um, but we expose a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of options to developers that know nothing about cryptography who might want to use cryptography. Um, and I think if it's really that complicated, which it is, uh, if it's really that hard to get it right, then we should not expose them to things like initialization vectors and, and choosing keys and whether or not they uh, do any sort of authentication on the cipher because most people know about you know encryption and decryption. They have a concept of what that is, but they don't know about ciphertext integrity. So uh, you can just modify the ciphertext and you know depending on what type of cipher mode is in use, um, and what type of uh, uh, cipher is in use, there's um, you know, different levels of malleability. You can change, but anyway, I don't want to talk too much about crypto, I want to talk about the environment. Um, so better advice is use like a high level library. You know, something that gives you a nice little encrypt function and a nice little decrypt function and takes care of all this nasty business for you. And if there's a problem, it's a problem with the library and that, that, that gets fixed. And uh, trust me, if you're not a cryptographer, there is no way that you're making uh, the the you're you're making way more and way bigger mistakes than the library maintainer would. So even if there's problems with the library, they're not going to be the kind of problems that you would write into crypto code yourself. So the other thing is memory corruption. Why on earth should I have to manage memory in 2014? I mean, like, going down to that level, but it's, I think it's the same thing that where people argue, oh, we can't turn on SSL site-wide because our web server will crash. Now, maybe if you're Netflix, but anybody else, it's not going to be that expensive. But I, I think that we really, you know, in, insofar as memory corruption, like, we have languages that take care of us for it, that for us. I think there's a lot of things that could be fixed at the language level and aren't. You know, so uh, PHP, for instance, patched the the bug where you could use a um, a null byte to truncate strings when they're handled by uh, native code objects uh, or the operating system, which is native code. Um, so uh, so yeah, that's great, and that makes things a lot harder to exploit. So let's talk about saving water. Uh, okay, I haven't got that much time left, so I'm going to try to hurry a little bit more. So let's talk about saving water. Now. You may say to yourself, but Dan, I'm made of like 80% water and like 10% alcohol, you know, uh, which is why I'm enjoying this talk so much right now. Um, Dan, I'm, made of, I'm like practically made of water and, and water is the most plentiful substance on earth. Well, yes, but clean water isn't. You can't just, you know, chug a, a cup full of river water 
uh, and expect that everything's going to go just fine. Um, it's, it doesn't really, you know, fresh water is the problem. There are, um, there are limited resources for fresh water, and so fresh water conservation is actually pretty important. Um, it's, it's needed for drinking, cooking, cleaning, and hygiene turns out to be a big reason that fresh water is used. So some tips for conserving water. Uh, you can limit the length of your showers, so if you just like get in there and, 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 and get out, um, you know, that's great. Uh, if you want to see whether a bath, if, I mean, if you take like really long showers, maybe consider um, plugging up the drain and taking a shower and seeing whether or not it comes all the way up to the sort of overflow point. Um, but try not to get that to that point at all. You know, limit the length of your showers. Um, you can put a, a plastic bottle with sand and water in the, the, the tank uh, on the back of a toilet. Uh, so, you can, um, so you can reduce the flow from the toilet. So if your toilet every uh, flushes like two gallons or so, you can take like a two liter bottle or a couple of 20 ounces and fill them with sand and water and stick them in the back of the tank. Um, and that will reduce the, the, the flushing. Um, so you can also urinate in the shower, and this <laughs> So, yes, this is a technically valid solution. And actually, this was a real piece of advice given to me by one of my roommates. And it was bad enough being told that I should pee on my feet to save water. It was worse knowing that it was my roommate who told me this, and that she was almost certainly doing this. Um, so it's, it's really funny because, yes, this absolutely works. You're saving a flush every time you pee on your feet in the shower. Um, you're, you're saving a flush, and that's like two gallons. Uh, you know, two gallons every time you do this. And pee is sterile. It, even if you have some sort of like infectious disease, who are you going to give it to? Yourself? And then it's just going to wash right down the drain and, you know, whatever, no big deal. Actually, I think it was somebody was telling me that in Brazil, they actually had like a PSA thing going on where they were like, hey, everybody, pee in your showers. You know, and it's actually, it's going to the same place. It's not like, you know, there's, there's some guy standing by like a water spout, like some good shower water. Oh, God, what is that? It's yellow. No, it, it's, it's going to the same place as the toilet flush. So it doesn't really matter if you pee in it. it it's really not a top problem technically, except that you have to be okay with peeing on your feet. So uh, I, I, I hear a lot of people say that to prevent tailgating, you should tell all your employees, don't hold the doors for other people. And this is something that we are socialized to do. We are socialized to hold doors for other people. If you're like walking behind somebody and they're like, like close the door in your face, that guy's a dick. Why did he do that? Come on, really? So, and, and that, if you tell your employees to do that, and like they're, they're alienating each other, and then there's still like plenty of people who are gonna hold the door anyway because they don't wanna be a dick. And actually, I support that. Um, you know, but, but you know, we, we have two ways, to, you have two ways to deal with that. Either you create a culture that allows that to be okay, which, hard, right, hard. Uh, I haven't come up with a, a good way to do that, but we'll talk about that in a second. Um, the other thing that you can do is to put in place a technical solution, so a man trap. And uh, for those of you who don't, does, does anyone not know what a man trap is? Okay, so a man trap is um, one of the, the simplest ones to understand is a, a revolving door with uh, where each sort of partition of the revolving door only has enough space for one person. And you swipe your badge and step in and you walk through and it only lets, you know, you through. And and that's it. So um, one badge, one person. If you try to fit two people through, it's not going to end well. Um, it's going to end with uh, you two getting stuck inside the revolving door and being real intimate. <sighs> like, just like, hey there. So I can't turn around with, with you in here. So that's fun. So nobody is going to let you come in with them. Like, it's, it's like, Nobody can fault you. Nobody can possibly fault you for not like letting them in. Like, hey, I forgot my badge. Want to get real close to me? Can I jump on your back? Piggyback ride. You know, literal piggybacking. So love that. Um, keep your computer locked. A lot of people um, don't lock their computers because they want to trust other people, and it's sort of a sign of distrust to lock your computer. So I've been told. I don't see it that way, but other people have told me, like, well, why, you know, I trust my coworkers. Um, why did you change my background to Michael Jackson? 
Well, because you left your screen unlocked. Uh, funny, you get it, right? No. Like, why would you do that? Um, anyway, that was a uh, uh, past company. Um, but so Google actually has an interesting uh, solution to this around the sort of like changing the culture thing. But really, you can just set group policy to set a green, aggressive screen lock, you know, like every 10 minutes or something like that of, of idle time, just lock the screen. And you really don't have to worry about this social thing. Um, but Google actually has an interesting solution here where they, uh, they have this thing called cheesing. And they have an internal website that just says like, hey, you've been cheesed. You left your screen unlocked and one of your colleagues uh, you know, played this joke on you. And uh, they turn it into a game. So like, they turn it into this thing where uh, you know, if you don't lock your screen, you're going to get cheesed. You know, and you're, it, so it plays on the sort of um, like competitive nature of humans. Um, so, and, and it makes it kind of okay to like mess with somebody's computer in this particular way when they've left it unlocked. So I like that solution. I don't think it worked in all corporate cultures, but I can definitely see it, work, uh, see it working at Google. So that's fun. So uh, let's talk about reducing consumption of petroleum-based products, um, specifically petrol. So um, the, the, the pollution that comes out of petroleum-based stuff is, is um, many, many, many faced, multi, multifaceted. Sure, there we go. That sounds like a good word. That sounds right. Um, so you're talking about air pollution, both, you know, like well, contributing to uh, climate change, um, contributing to air pollution, and then, you know, even just the harvesting of petroleum uh, results in sometimes oil spills, which are very, very nasty, very dangerous, uh, and damaging to wildlife. Um, so you can walk to work. And walking to work has a lot of different advantages. You save money on gas, uh, you reduce your car insurance, uh, uh, you, your car maintenance uh, costs, um, you get a lot of exercise, and actually, um, does, is anyone here living in Texas besides me? Gotcha. So. Uh, along the sides of the roads in Texas, there are these, these big electronic billboards, uh, especially on the, the big highways, um, at, at least in Austin. But there are these billboards that say, like, you know, there have been this many, road, th this many deaths on Texas roads already. And in, like, mid-February, it was already up to 500. Yeah. So, fun fact for you guys. Uh, I guess in 2008, there was a single day where nobody died of a car accident. One day, nobody died of a car accident in the States. And that was the last day on record where that happened. Every single day since, like that one day in 2008, somebody has died in a car accident every single day from that point. Which is like nuts. Like, holy crap, that many people die in car accidents? So you're actually greatly reducing your chances of death by walking to work. So that's great. Um, and it also reduces uh, our dependence on other, you know, foreign oil-rich countries. So that's good. Uh, but this is what happened when I um, tried to figure out how uh, much of a pain it would be for me to walk to work. So, not happening. Not, not happening. This is not a scalable solution. So let's talk about password security. Um, so if you, so does anybody know what Zuko's triangle is? Okay. So Zuko's triangle is sort of a, here's three things, pick two, right? So passwords can be, you know, passwords can have two of three of these, these, um, these um, attributes. Thank you. Thank you. Jeez, my, my brain today is gone, absolutely gone. So it can, they can be human memorable, they can be secure, and they can be globally unique. They cannot be all three, but they can be two of the three. So, if you have human memorable pa if you have human memorable passwords that are also secure, you probably use one password that's like human memorable and secure in every single place that you could possibly use a password, right? Um, so it's just there's this there's this problem with passwords of that, but you can sort of cheat. Instead of trying to use like super strong passwords that are never uh, reused anywhere, uh, 
just trying to remember it all in your head, which doesn't work because like, um, you know, it's easy to, to get above 50, like it's really easy to have like more than 50 accounts across the internet. And some of them you don't use for years, so good luck memorizing that. Um, so yes, this does technically work and it has a lot of wonderful benefits, but you, you just can't do it, right? It's does, it doesn't scale. You know, if you have only one password that you need to remember for one service, then it works. But even then, you probably hate computers if that's the case. So better advice is to use some sort of technical uh, measure to augment your ability to memorize passwords. Um, so one thing that I usually recommend to people is get a copy of KeePass. Uh, if you ever need to use it on uh, Unix-based systems, uh, it works with Mono. Uh, so that's that's wonderful, but it's a, a Windows-based program. Um, so you can, you can use that uh, with a YubiKey in one-time password mode because there's a plugin for that. Um, even, if, even if you don't do that, so let's say you're uh, just a, uh, some random home user, uh, you can just you know, have KeePass in your database on a uh, thumb drive and anytime you need to log into anything, just pop it into a computer and you're good because probably the only things you're ever gonna use are Windows computers. Um, so that's fun. But um, in the case that you have a password that you need to remember, uh, that let, let's say that you lose this thumb drive or you don't have it on you and you desperately need to log into something. Well, just remember the password for your email account and nothing else. So create one strong password that's only used for your email and just use that to reset things. So you're still not breaking Zuko's triangle because with the password database, you have secure and, uh, secure and uh, globally unique, but not human memorable because you're not memorizing it. You have this little thing that memorizes them for you and encrypts it properly. So good stuff there. And then over here you have, you know, something that's human memorable and secure, but you're not, you know, you, you're not using it everywhere. You just memorize the one. So it works out pretty well, I think. Um, so finally, I want to talk about uh, packaging, eco-friendly packaging. So here we have some, uh, some chicken feet packaged up. Um, I don't know why I chose chicken feet, except it was like one of the first uh, things that came up for packaging on the Creative Commons image search. Um, but it's, this, is a, this is what accounts for a lot of uh, a waste that goes into landfills. Um, so, and it's, 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 I mean, when you take a look at what litter is usually made up of, it's like cigarette butts and then packaging, you know, soda cups and Big Mac clamshell containers and things like that. I always see those on the side of the road and makes, I guess it makes sense. But, you know, this is often the source of litter. Um, and packaging creates um, not only uh, litter type waste and fills up landfills, but it also generally is made of some sort of plastic. Um, so what you can do is buy more goods that don't have packaging. You know, um, one thing you could do is uh, instead of buying Ethernet cables uh, pre-assembled in like a big plastic shell case that you can't even cut with like hedge clippers, um, you can buy, you know, a spool of cable and then crimp your own. Um, and that actually saves you money too. Um, but in, in terms of food, you can buy more fruits and vegetables because you don't I mean, you don't generally see fruits and vegetables packaged unless you go to Costco and then you're buying like 50 apples. Um, but um, overpackaged goods, you know, you can usually find an alternative. Um, and if not, well, ask yourself if you really need what you're buying. Um, you know, if you can uh, buy stuff in reusable packaging, that's great. There's actually this um, thing called upcycling. There's this sort of movement in the packaging community where people are trying to make packaging that is usable for something else once it's finished being, you know, finished containing something. So for instance, uh, like a mug with a cap screwed onto the top of it um, that holds some like bath bomb or something. So you take that home, you know, bomb your bath or whatever you do with bath bombs. And then, uh, uh, you know, use the, wash out the mug and use it for, you know, drinking things, holding things that you drink. That's great. And this is all fantastic until you see this and you're like, oh, I don't care what that's packaged in. <laughs> oh yeah, water jet pack, you know? So um, it's all well and good telling people not to click on links 
uh, from people that they don't know or from, you know, that, that, that they weren't expecting. But if it's important enough to them, for whatever reason, they're going to click anyway. Um, unfortunately, I think this is just kind of a losing situation. Uh, I don't believe that we can ever really teach people not to click on base because uh, there, there, there have been con men for years and years and years and years and years. You know, like they have, before recorded history, people were tricking each other, right? So this is this is not something that's going away. And you know, given that you're convincing somebody to do something, like this is. I mean, there's education, but you're never going to be able to completely stop this. So I think the proper solution is probably isolation, segregation of, ne uh, of networks, you know. Uh, the government does a sort of red and black thing where, I can't remember which is which, but one is this network touches the internet and other networks, and one is this network contains uh, machines that hold or transmit sensitive data. So hopefully never the twain shall meet. Doesn't always work that way, but you know, it's, it's a great idea. And so I think the best advice that you can give is never do work on personal machines and never do personal stuff on work machines. And this is tough. You know, some people don't uh, ha bring their, want to bring their personal machines out with them to a hotel or whatever. Um, one technical solution that I've seen to this, uh, which admittedly is a bit expensive, is give every employee a tablet that they can use on a separate wireless network to do personal things. So it's kind of like, look, we know you're going to do personal things at work and while on the road. Here's a tablet. You can use that for personal stuff. Don't do personal stuff on the work laptop. I think that's a pretty cool idea. Um, you know, and it's even still a work asset, so you can take that back from them once they leave the company. I, I think that that's a, a pretty good idea. It probably won't work for a lot of companies since, you know, a tablet for every employee is a, you know, maybe a bit much, but it's something to think about. So let's conclude, let's talk a little bit about why these things failed. So complexity, that's a big killer. If, if you make things too complex, uh, they will either be ignored or people will fail to do them correctly because they are so complex. Make security solutions easier for people, you know, and they're more likely to do. And, and this, this holds true for anything. If you want somebody to do something, make it really easy for them to do it. Uh, if I have to fill out a, a form, like how many people would answer a five-page survey for five bucks? How about a one-question survey for five bucks? You know, like make it easier for people and they're more likely to do things. Um, social norms, you know, we talked about the peeing in the shower. Um, if, if it goes against uh, what, you know, if, if we are socialized not to do something, we're not going to do it. There is social pressure to consider. Um, human nature, you know, we, we, sometimes we just want things and it undermines what would other be good, otherwise be uh, the right actions. So consider that you're talking to humans here, not machines. Consider that these people just don't care in the same way that you don't really care about the environment. Um, Generally, people don't really care about computer security. They would like to, they would like to put in more effort, but they just don't that much. And now, hopefully, you all have come to an understanding as of why. Uh, maybe you feel a little bit closer to your users. Um, and then scalability. You know, um, there are other things that can render perfectly technically good advice useless, but this is a sampling, and hopefully, it's gotten you to think a little bit more about why technically correct measures don't always make good advice. Um, my name is Dan Crowley. Um, this is my Twitter handle and my email address. Uh, should you want to contact me or tell me that I'm uh, an awful speaker. Um, but uh, I'll open it up for questions now. Do we, do we have half time for that? Sure. Okay, great. Yeah, I'm not uh, holding up anybody else's talk, so. <laughs> questions? Okay, I guess you got, oh, yes, sir. Uh, not a question, but an observation. So I waited to find out that nobody had questions before making the observation. But um, uh, this gives me a lot of food for thought. I think this talk follows the general themes as laid out by Justine yesterday 
of communicating and translating. Uh, in this way, in this talk, you sort of flip it around by translating from an outside non-InfoSec example back into the InfoSec industry. But yet there's still sort of the, uh, and then sort of retranslating back out to the regular users. So I just wanted to make an observation that that seems to fit in with an ongoing theme of uh, reaching out and moving outside of our echo chambers. So I really appreciated it. Thank you. Uh, well, I guess that's, uh, that's it for questions. So everybody, thank you.